God wants New Zealand back. That's what his burden is. And I got a vision not long ago, since I've been here, of these islands as they were when God had them to himself. And I felt I was looking down on them there in the ocean, and they were beautiful. They were his back garden, covered with trees. It was a lovely feeling, and he enjoyed it. And then he saw certain men come in canoes, and they came here with spirit worship and ancestor worship and superstition. He began to spoil it for God. And then years later, he saw other men coming here in big ships. And they came with mixed motives, and there was quite a lot of greed in there. And they committed acts of injustice against those already here. And that spoiled it even more for the Lord. And I just got the sense that he would love these islands back. And yet, surprise, surprise, it wasn't that he wanted them back empty as he had them first. He wanted them back full of beautiful people. Because he said, the people were my masterpiece. They are my image. Not the trees, not the mountains, not the rivers, but the people. A people who want to be holy rather than happy. And a nation that will be a model to the nations of a people who are living under the government of God. And I believe God intends you to be one of those countries where he demonstrates his kingdom. Now that's my main burden. And I'm going to share it in many different ways, uh, but that's the heart of it. And particularly on Sunday night, I believe he wants us to begin to act to retake territory from Satan in the name of the Lord. And we're going to do that. We're not just holding a meeting and having a sermon and some songs on Sunday. We are actually going to take territory from Satan in the name of the Lord. So I hope you'll turn up on Sunday ready to occupy the land, because that's what we're after. Now tonight, it is in a sense laying a foundation for that and, and sharing one of the burdens that is part of that large burden, to share one of the things that is going to be necessary in order to achieve that objective. About two years ago, I said to God, I asked him a question. And incidentally, if you want to get into a two-way conversation with God, why don't you ask him questions? I dare to say this, that if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, that if you ask God a question, you can assume that the next thing that comes into your mind and heart is God's answer. And you will be right, nine times out of ten. You'll soon learn to distinguish the tenth and why you got your lines crossed on the tenth time. But one lady came to me after I said that and said, surely it's not as easy as that. I said, you try. And an hour and a half later, she was back with a, a, a look of awe in her face, but smiling. And she said, he spoke. If you want to hear from God, if you've never heard from God directly, if prayer for you is like speaking into a telephone without pressing button A, then may I suggest you ask him one question. And I will guarantee you'll get an answer within five minutes. And the question would be, Lord, is there anything in my life you don't like? Try that question. The reason why most people don't hear from God is that they don't want to hear what he has to say. That's why they don't get through. So anyway, I've got into the way of what I call interrogatory prayer, which means to put God on the spot and ask him questions. And you'll find the Bible is full of men who got into interrogatory prayer, and that's when they got answers. And so I said to the Lord two years ago, how do you see the church in England? As you look down from heaven at your people, how do you see them? How do you feel about them? What's happening? How do you see the situation? And he gave me the most surprising and unexpected answer, which I have lived with ever since. His answer was... Samson's hair is growing again. And you know, a shiver went. It goes up my spine now to think that that's how God saw his church in England. And since I've been in New Zealand, I've been asking him the same question. And he's given me the same answer. He says, here too, Samson's hair is growing again. Now, I find that when God gives a verse, he doesn't mean you to rip it out of the Bible and use it as a motto. A text out of context becomes a pretext. You can put that on the back burner and think about it later. But if God gives you a verse, it is because 
your situation is parallel to the situation in which he first said that. And therefore, if you'll go back and study the situation in which he first said those words, you will learn why he is saying them to you. And God is giving us prophetic texts these days. For example, with the leaders tomorrow morning, I will be speaking on the verse, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. And I'd be a wealthy man if I had five dollars for everybody who's given that text to me in the last three years. How many here have been receiving that text as God's word for now? Could I see? Do you see? People are listening and they're hearing the same thing from the same God. But Samson's hair is growing again. So we're going to look at that story again tonight. And there are certain particular messages, burdens, themes, thrusts, challenges that he wants to bring out of that story. And particularly for you at this time in New Zealand. And I just echo that the timing of this visit is perfect. I was last here eight years ago. And three times, I think, between then and now, I have had a pressing invitation to come back. And God says, don't go, don't go, don't go. And when I asked him why, he said, they have not worked through what you said last time. And then about 18 months ago, I think it must have been, I met Ian Grant in Birmingham. Was it 18 months ago? And he came up to me, and he invited me to come. He took about two minutes to get the question up, and I took two minutes to get the answer right. And it was the same two minutes, because as soon as you gave me that question, would you come, the Lord had already said in my heart, go with this man. Go with this man, and I will bless the visit. And so I came. People say, what did you come with Youth for Christ for? You're not a youth. I'm just about to start Age for Christ in England um, for all the ex-Youth for Christ people. But anyway, yeah, I'm not. And I don't find it, I do find culture shock. It, the music doesn't always grab me. But I feel free in Christ. For example, I'm free to wear a tie. Isn't that freedom? And I'm free not to wear jeans. I'm free in Christ. But bless them, they've accepted me as I am. I'm 52 years of age, one foot in the grave and the other on a banana skin, and here I am. And it's just good to come with Youth for Christ, and I'm grateful to them for taking the risk, and they took big risks. I know they will lose some support because they invited me to come. But I believe God will honor that courage. And he'll just divert the support through people who see what God is doing. So... Uh, I'm grateful to you for Christ, and I'm glad for this one opportunity to say so. I'm grateful to them for their boldness in inviting a controversial figure, so I'm called to come and minister. Right, well, let's turn to the Word of God now, and let's look into... Uh, if you've got half a Bible, you've got the wrong half. We're going way back into the Old Testament. And the book of Judges. The index of the Bible was not inspired by God, but I'm sure it was inspired by men. So if you have problems, stick your finger in the index. And I want to read quite a chunk of scripture tonight. I find that most people don't get the message of the Word of God because they only nibble at it. They have a few verses here and a few verses there. Do you know when the Living Bible came out, we read the Bible right through from cover to cover non-stop aloud. And it took us 82 and a half hours. We started on a Sunday evening at 9 o'clock. And we finished on a Thursday morning at breakfast time. And uh, nobody read for more than 15 minutes. And 2,000 people came and we sold half a ton of Bibles. And people were dropping in for an hour and staying all night. They were saying, I'll just wait till the end of this chapter. No, I just want to get to the end of this book. No, I just want to find out what happens in the next book. And they found themselves absorbed. How many people here believe the Bible is the Word of God? How many here have read it right through? I thought you believed it was the Word of God. How many have here have read another book right through? Come on, be honest. I challenge those of you who said you believed the Bible was the Word of God. You may say you do. But if you really believe that this is God's Word and that it's more important that you read this book than any other book, you'd have read it through. So you just start right now, three chapters a day, five on Sundays, and you'll be through it one year from now. 
But it's time you realize there's more in the Bible than you thought there was. And it's God's word. If you really believe that, you'd practice it. But I challenge you whether you really believe it, if you've never read it. All right?